What does starting a new year mean to you? Well, as Christians, I want to talk to you about resolve as we go throughout this year to resolve to seek the Lord. So resolve means to settle or to find a solution to a problem or a dispute. You know, and as a verb, it actually means to decide firmly on a course of action. You know, the noun for resolve means to determine to do something. That's what I want to talk to you today about. As Jesus followers, we must resolve to seek the Lord no matter what. Listen, how many people here on a daily basis feel like giving the Lord and the things of the Lord first place in our life? Listen, I know that we lead busy lives. I know, I get it. We work. We have kids. We have a family to raise. We have a house to clean. We have a husband or a wife to care for. I mean, there's maintenance that needs to be done on something. And some of us might provide care for elderly parents. And uh, some of us might even be 24-7 caregivers, okay? And these smartphones these days and all the technological advances are supposed to make us work smarter, not harder. But I don't know about anyone else, but I don't see that happening in my own life. You know, but God's word tells us in Matthew 6, 33 and 34, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. His word encourages us to focus one day at a time. Yes, we can plan for the future and we should and schedule appointments. And we should do all those things. But in order to live a godly lifestyle day after day after day, we need to seek the kingdom in his righteousness first and foremost. So let's make this practical. How do we do that? Well, number one, we must start by filling our hearts with love for Jesus Christ so that we can fall in love with him so much that we'll do anything to please him. I have prayed this for my children since they were little because I know that if they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, then their desires will be bent on pleasing the Lord. You know, think about it. When you first came to the Lord, it probably wasn't because you thought about all the things that you're not going to be able to do anymore or the words that you're not going to be able to use anymore. No, that's not why. You came to salvation because Jesus wooed you into a personal and intimate relationship with him. He pursued you with his love. You know, Jesus more than anything wants be a part of our daily lives and he wants to build a relationship with us. God is first and foremost after our hearts. In a world that defines us by what we do or what we look like, it's hard for us to understand that God doesn't do that. You know, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We might think for a tiny moment that we enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, but when we feel that relentless pursuit of the Lord, it doesn't even compare. Number two, we must fill our minds with scripture. We must intentionally and actively replace our old negative thoughts with scripture. It takes discipline and intentionality to memorize scripture. It's not easy, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, it's definitely doable. And when I say memorize scripture, I'm not talking about saying it word perfectly with book and verse behind it every single time. 
I'm talking about knowing that if God be for us, who can be against us? I'm talking about knowing that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, all of those are verses straight out of the Bible. And some of them I know the, the book and the chapter, but it's more important to be able to use that, use scripture as our sword, use it as a way to do battle in this world. When we're in the midst of challenging situation, that comes out of nowhere. We don't have time to grab our Bibles and start thumbing through looking for a word. No, that's the power of memorizing scripture, to be able to immediately combat the lies with truth. It's not going to be perfect, and it's not going to happen overnight. We must not lose heart because it will happen. It takes time. It takes discipline. It takes intentionality, but it's a goal worth pursuing, and we have the Holy Spirit to help us. John 14, 26 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. The Bible is full of things that the Father wants to say to us, but we have to open it in order for him to speak it to us. Number three, we must be friends with people who will hold us accountable. You know, it's easy to talk to our non-Christian friends and make all kinds of excuses as to why we're doing this or not doing that. But when we have other Jesus followers walking with us, we don't get to use those same old excuses. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day approaching. Church, listen, we need each other. We need accountability. We need prayer partners. We need prayer warriors. We need small groups. We just need each other for the simple fact that it's easy to fall back into old habits when we're alone. It's the body of believers. It's the church of Jesus Christ. You know, that's who we are. When I refer to you as the church, I'm not talking about a building and four walls. We, God's people, are the church. Number four, we must fill our souls with resolve. We have to do whatever it takes to live a godly life. Once I got saved, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I did know that I wasn't to follow man anymore and my own selfish ambitions, but I didn't know what I was supposed to do now as a Jesus follower. And I found this verse. It was much later after I became saved, but Ephesians 5, 8 through 10 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light for the fruit of of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. Amen. We can't let anything get in the way of us living a godly life that pleases the Lord. We must make it our goal to only do things that please the Father. Are we going to mess up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course we are. I'll share a quick testimony with you because we all know that none of us are perfect and I don't claim to be. I fell off my pursuit of seeking the Lord and it showed up in my choices, mainly in my choices of speech. And I don't mean by cursing, I mean by gossiping. I literally got sucked into a situation where I forgot who I was representing and who I was most concerned with pleasing. And I had a conflicted soul. And it was so uncomfortable. I believe it's Joyce Myers who says that you know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you when you can't do what you once did 
and feel good about it. Amen. I can testify to that. So I had to confess that sin and I asked the Lord for forgiveness. And I have an accountability partner who has agreed to pray for me and I'm praying for her. And I've resolved to seek the Lord again with my whole self, not just part of me. He wants our entire being to be surrendered to him. And that doesn't just happen. It doesn't. I have one more confession in victory to share. I started reading this novel and found out it was the first of five. Well, I got hooked on reading through the first one and I missed some scheduled chores. I lost some sleep and then I started the next one. But the Holy Spirit was unsettled inside of me and I no longer felt the pleasure of reading this novel anymore. But the Lord didn't come to my house and take the novels out of my hands and bag them up and give them back to the person who gave them to me. No, I had to do that. I had to be obedient to the Spirit and do the physical work myself. We're talking about practical, godly living here, not some pie-in-the-sky version of what it means to live a godly life that pleases the Lord and glorifies His name. Now, if anyone here is listening to this and they're feeling condemned, I want you to stop. Condemnation comes from the enemy. Condemnation tells us that we've gone too far to turn around now. It tells us that God will never forgive us for what we've done. And that is a lie straight from the enemy. Truth says in Romans 8, 1, that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Conviction, yes. But listen, conviction is a good thing. Conviction points us to what we're doing wrong, but it also points us to a solution. Oswald Chambers said, conviction of sin is one of the rarest things that ever strikes a man. It is the threshold of an understanding of God. Jesus Christ said that when the Holy Spirit came, he would convict of sin. And when the Holy Spirit rouses the conscience and brings him into the presence of God, it is not his relationship with men that bothers him, but his relationship with God. I was bothered by my disobedience in my relationship with the Lord once the Holy Spirit convicted me of sin. The Holy Spirit never encourages our carnal nature, the flesh, never, never, because we long to fellowship with a holy God. Somebody has got to change and it will not be God. God offers eternal encouragement by the way of the gospel. Jesus's death, burial, and resurrection is the starting point of all truth. The truth convicts when we are guilty of sin. Conviction is the way of getting us back on the right path, and we should expect and welcome it as his children when we are not walking in a manner that pleases him. John 16, 13 through 14 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what we make known to you. It's important to God how we live our daily lives. If it wasn't, we'd all just get saved and go home to heaven. But that's not the case for us because right now we are all here. We are all here, but there will be a last experience for all of us and then eternity, okay? We need to live our lives wisely because we don't know how much longer we have left. You know, praise God that his pursuit of his children is relentless and God will always lead us with love and conviction and never accusation 
or condemnation. So I hope that message brings you encouragement as you go into the new year. Again, I want to encourage you to seek resolve, to be resolved, to seek the Lord daily as children of God. Let's be resolved to live lives that please him as we go into this new year. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you that you care for us, that your love for us is real and it's personal for each one of us. And Lord, as we go into this new year, help us to be resolved to seek you daily and not the things of this world. Lord, we want to seek you with our whole hearts and we just thank you and praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Please like and share and leave me a comment so we can get more people involved in this conversation. All right, take care. God bless.